This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you are tuned to The Baseline, Kali Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. We are nearing that time frame, NBA All-Star Weekend. The games are getting intense, and really, it seems like the pressure is on and mounting for teams who look like they should be championship caliber and drastic moves being made, drastic measures being taken. I mean, all things, all roads are leading to an exciting second half of NBA basketball play, but we got to get to the all-star break uh, first. And in order to break down the stuff that's already been happening and what's been a very wild week of NBA play and NBA news, you know, I got my right-hand man, 50 grand NBA aficionado, Don Mac contributor, right of one of the illest websites, www.shawsports.net. Big Kahuna and PNC, Mr. Warren Shaw, ripping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. Clearly, you are lamping lovely and not dealing with the winter storm that I just had to endure. No, man, I don't have tropical storm Jonas Valanciunas, or sorry, winter storm Jonas, you know, messing up my life down here in South Florida. But like I said before, last couple of weeks, we've had a little bit of chill in the air. You know, we're in the, in the 40s here, so it's, you know, a little brisk for us. People talking about busting out their Tims and jackets and all that. But nevertheless, as you said earlier, man, another great week of NBA basketball, and that's what's important, man. You know, the basketball is keeping us warm. Oh, well, definitely. I mean, while I was hunkered down during the winter storm the other night, I figured let me just flip on like three or four different games and, you know, just keep myself preoccupied. But uh, the, the worst part about it is knowing that I had to get up the next day and just have to start shoveling snow, to start shoveling snow. But I know out in Cleveland, we're going to get into this in our segment of the breakdown. Something's getting shoveled out there, and it definitely isn't any snow as we will be discussing about the unprecedented and really uh, blindsiding move by the Cleveland Cavaliers, GM David Griffin, firing coach David Blatt, and now Tyrone Liu, the assistant head coach, is now taking over moving forward. Uh, we will be discussing that also in our segment of The Drop. We'll be talking about the NBA Midseason Awards. It's around this time of the year. Yeah, everybody starts talking about it towards the end of the year. But we like to discuss guys who have already made an impact for their teams at the midway point. Who is deserving to be the team, the MVP of the league? Who's deserving to be coach of the year? Who's deserving of being sixth man of the year, defensive player of the year? Sean and I will break down who we think are deserving of those type of awards. And then also, we'll be giving our predictions to the all-star reserves. Guys that we know should be deserving, should be getting the nod uh, to be playing all-star weekend up in Toronto. And of course, coast to coast covering all of the news in the association. So we got a lot of stuff to discuss, a lot of stuff to break down. And of course, our doors are always welcome to you and yours for, and thank you for listening to us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. We always encourage you to get us at the Twitter side, get at my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA or get at me at Game Face Lee. But we always encourage you to get at the show's Twitter handle at NBA underscore the baseline, hashtag up the baseline. Let us know who you are and what you're about. Available on all the major platforms, available on iTunes, Microsoft, TuneIn, Stitcher Radio, and Player FM. So we encourage you to download any one of those and allow us to be your go-to resource discussing all things NBA. And if you've been checking us out, we also are doing our thing on Rabble TV. So be sure to check out at Rabble TV or just go to Rabble TV. We're doing it lovely, the baseline, discussing the hot-button topics throughout the course of the NBA season, so we're also exclusive on there as well, too. You know how we do, and you know how we like to set it off. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. Break it down to the bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. And I know unless you were hit by this, this, this winter storm, Jonas, and your television power got knocked out or your wife or your husband uh, took away your Fios television set before you can blink an eye. I'm sure everybody was aware of the situation that happened with regards to the Cleveland Cavaliers firing David Black, uh, not even at the midway point of this season, really 41 games into the season. David Black basically had the best record in the Eastern Conference at 30 and 11 with a Cleveland Cavaliers team. And apparently, and according to the words of David Griffin, he just didn't see and feel the togetherness of this team under the leadership of David Blatt. And Shaw, we can go so many different directions with what has happened, but let's start with the impact that this is actually going to have 
for the Cleveland Cavaliers moving forward because everybody knew that the Golden State Warriors lambasting the Cleveland Cavaliers on their home court would have been a bad look. But to do this when your head coach has, has in some way helped this basketball team to being, again, the best team in the Eastern Conference, only being the head coach for not more than a year and a half. I mean, where, where is the logic in doing what Griffin did to fire the head coach at this point in the season to justify this kind of move? The logic only stems from a chemistry standpoint. You know, he said it had nothing to do with the actual wins and losses per se and said that the Golden State game wasn't was the wasn't the triggering point per se. It was just a matter of looking at the team and understanding that they were not galvanized after wins and they only came together when nobody thought that they could do things and the whole nine. Um, you know, there's a lot of reports that came out since then. You know, I think Chris Haynes, um, he made a report that Blatt was almost fired after Christmas. After, I guess, the first Golden State loss. Um, and, you know, a couple wins after that, they, they, they kind of seemed like they were headed in the right direction. So Griffin decided to give Blatt a little bit more time. Whatever the case may be, this is strictly a move about chemistry and then potentially getting LeBron's guy in place. The interesting caveat to that, which we'll get in a little bit down the line, is that a Wojo report, I think the very next day, stated that Mark Jackson was actually LeBron's guy, but the franchise wasn't willing to go or bend to that to, in that direction. So they had to settle kind of on Tyrone Liu being the guy that's going to fill in here. But this is really strictly done from a chemistry standpoint and how they didn't feel Blatt was getting the guys to come together in the locker room. I, I got to tell you, Sean, I, and I allowed this. We, 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 we touched upon this when we did our Rabblecast TV a few days ago when the story broke that David Blatt was fired. Um, and I knew that us going into this podcast, I wanted to be a little bit more logical in the way that this is being approached. And I don't want to sound an extremist. You know me. I try to be as passionate, but as I, I, I try to keep my inferences with a level of perspective that is true to sports and the way that we see how sports culture is derived. And in a business where things are results oriented and even nowadays where certain head coaches probably get a little bit more leeway than others. This to me really absolutely makes no kind of sense whatsoever. And the only reason why I say that is because by doing what you're doing, okay, you are not making this situation easy. Forget David Blatt for a moment. But where is it that it's going to be very easy for Tyron Liu to make this type of transition? It's almost as if you're again putting the onus back on LeBron James. And keep in mind, this is not the first time that the Cleveland Cavaliers has had this go around with the way that they handle their coaches and the quote unquote chemistry in the locker room between coaches and the players. It just almost seems to me that it's easy for the Cavaliers to fire a head coach than to really go into that locker room. If you're David Griffin and I've listened to David Griffin sit on the podium and I've listened to him, you know, basically give his 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 you know, his epitaph about what he sees and feels, but under no circumstances in his voice and the way that he looks at things, do I see a man that truly commands the total respect of the organization? Because as far as I'm concerned, you can tell me all you want to that this was on you when ultimately this was on the players. The players ultimately came to you and said, I don't like Coach Black. I don't like what we do with Coach Black. I'm sure there was enough talk in the background to say we need to do something about coach platt so again and i use this terminology loosely it's the animals running the asylum okay if you're griffin you should be going to these guys saying hey i'm the one that that, that, that is a part of cutting your paycheck okay this guy he is your coach you need to follow suit he is there's there's a reason why he is the coach he would have been the coach before lebron james he should be the coach after lebron james and i just get the sense that this, again, is going to rear its ugly head and is going to derail the Cleveland Cavaliers' ability to be where they really need to be and should be probably for the next few years, which is vying for an NBA title. But I don't know how that's going to happen when these type of distractions occur and there's so much disarray and malfunction in the organizational aspect that is afflicting the culture of basketball, like you alluded to, that the expectations are with this basketball team in order to have a championship mindset. Yeah, a couple of things that play here. Obviously, I, I 100% agree with you. It seems like last year was the the galvanizing, uh, I guess, you know, proclamation of, of, of faith in truth 
of Vlad, you know, from David Griffin. That happened last year. You didn't really see that th- this season. And I guess because a lot of people didn't feel like, well, you know, they made it to the NBA Finals. They had those injuries. What if, what if, what if? Um, and the Blatt rumors of firing weren't nearly as strong as they were, say, last season, um, you know, in, in late December, early January. Um, yes, there were still those rumblings, but they weren't as, you know, immediate and, 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 and wide reaching as they were last season. Um, and Griffin came to Blatt's age last year, but it, it appeared at some point during this season, you know, Griffin decided maybe made up his mind and he didn't come out or didn't have to, didn't feel like anything was needed to be said about Blatt and making sure um, that he was going to be that guy. And maybe definitely not to the public, but maybe that's something that should have been said, you know, internally to his team and to his roster. The one thing that I found, I found very, very telling about his press conference was that he told Dan Gilbert, the owner, and Gilbert was surprised. Gal- Gilbert didn't see it coming at, at all. Um, and, you know, there's all these other rumors now that when they said, oh, when they called the Cavs players together, that they thought they were announcing a, a Kevin Love trade. So a lot of people didn't really know Blatt was on the proverbial hot seat at this point in the season because, again, he's, a, what, a week away from being announced as the, as the All-Star Game head coach? And now he's no longer even on the roster, not, not coaching this team. So there, there's a lot going on with, with that. But I do feel like they put themselves in another predicament now. Um, there's a lot of pressure on Ty, on Ty Lue to be immediately impactful and to take this team to that next level, which obviously was just half a step away from being an NBA champion. So if Lou doesn't get them to the promised land this year, quote, unquote, as long as they stay healthy, then what is it to become of him? I think he said the same thing as much as like, I could be gone just as, just as easy as David was. So this is a situation that is definitely going to continue to play itself out over the, over the coming months. Um, and the Cavaliers have a lot of drama in a quote, unquote, the land. You're tuned to the baseline, Cal Lee Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. It's our segment of the breakdown as we're discussing the firing of David Blatt. What were, what will the Cavaliers do? Where do they go from here? And, and you know what, Shaw, let me, to, to add on your point about what, you know, what Tyron Lue has said, here's my, here's my take from this. Tyron Lue now, remember, he got hired as the highest paid assistant coach in the NBA. So now the commitment has to be there. You cannot justify paying Tyron Lue this kind of money if you didn't know that at some point, if you were going to get rid of David Blatt, that he should equivocally be the, the next man up, so to speak, to be the head coach. And, and I get it. Maybe there was, you know, the, 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 the speculations that LeBron actually wanted Mark Jackson to be the head coach. But to me, again, this is the Cleveland Cavaliers basically doing themselves in. They, they're cornering themselves in a situation that at the end of the day, we can sit here and we can we can we can post blame on LeBron. We can post blame on the players, but you know what? LeBron st- he has his two rings still, right? Cleveland still has Cleveland, and the way that the Cavaliers organization runs, you know, the Cleveland Cavaliers organization is being ran. And at the and we can sit here and we can say, yep, they, these guys found a way to screw themselves again. It's 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 never that before when the Cavaliers didn't have talent that they didn't have a good enough organization to get themselves to the prominent land. Now they have the talent. They just don't know how to, to harness the talent to keep their focus at the matter at hand, which is to go out and beat each beat other teams and not beat themselves up. Yeah. I mean, but that's something that Lou is supposed to be able to figure out. And that's what David Griffin hopes. He really does hope that this is a guy who, you know, for the most part, players have been coming to, have been talking to, and you see this culture, and you've seen it, obviously, you know, listening to different shows and watching television, you understand that head coaches are, are, aren't are necessarily the most liked guys in the room. It's often the assistant coaches who have the true ear of the players, but does that role now change with Lou elevated to this position? And the fact that they didn't make him an interim coach, they've given, they've given him a three-year deal um, that goes to show, okay, well, they have all this faith in him, but that doesn't mean he can't be gone if he doesn't produce. So a lot of this is on Lou. A lot of this is on the general management, but a lot of it is on the players too, as I think you alluded to a little bit earlier. They have to buy in. Now they've quote unquote gotten what they've wanted. You know, at least LeBron has. Um, Now, is he going to be the the leader on and off the floor saying, hey guys, Ty's Ty's trying to teach us something here. And, you know, a lot of the questions about is is, is Ty Lue going to hold LeBron accountable? And I think there was, hold on, there was something that even Brendan Haywood had said that there was like film sessions where Black would it would skip over LeBron, you know, LeBron did something wrong and whatever the case may be, which is really, really strange because it's like, okay, well, Black, he, he wasn't hard coaching LeBron, but Lou would be the guy that would say, well, hold on a second here, LeBron, you missed this or you missed that. So 
that is where a lot of people are still concerned. Does LeBron want to be hard coached? And is he going to be the leader that buys in now to after he's gotten what he's wanted again and lead this team to the promise? All right, so then, now, Sean, and if we're saying that this stuff now comes to light, now this bolds the question. What kind of LeBron James are we really talking about now that's back in Cleveland, right? Like, we praise LeBron James for his efforts in shouldering this basketball team when only one-third of this trifecta was only available being him in the NBA Finals. And he was basically willing this team to possibly pushing it to a Game 7 against the Golden State Warriors. And now we're coming to this, 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 this crossroad, so to speak, about the mentality of LeBron James, the, the pressure to win a championship in a city, in a, in, in, in a town that has not seen or sniffed championship glory, right? So what is this now saying about LeBron James? Are, are we basically backtracking on, on the fact that LeBron James' maturation process, you know, was not as what we thought it was? That it was basically supplemented by the fact that he had Pat Riley, he had Eric Spolstra, Dwayne Wade, all of them championship people, people who already had those rings. So what are we now saying about LeBron James? Yeah, well, I think we're saying a lot. You know, it's one of those things where we still recognize him as one of the greatest talents in in, in, in the world and one that we've ever even laid our eyes on when it comes to basketball. But he does seem to have a, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a prima donna approach when it comes to, um, you know, how he wants to be coached and handled. A lot of that, a lot of those rumors, and again, these are unsubstantiated per se, but a lot of the rumors of his first trip in Cleveland or his first stint in Cleveland about what he was able to do and the entourages and all that stuff and how Mike Brown treated him and then how part of the reasons why he left Miami because he wasn't able to push Riley and Spolster around um, and they weren't, they weren't willing to bend to his whim into a lot of his uh, personnel demands, if you will. Um, and, and, and that's why he ended up leaving, going back to going back home to some degree and, and going to a situation where he feels like, OK, he could be a little bit placated to get some of the things that he wanted. Listen, you can't deny the fact that he's he is who he is and he's led his team to the five straight NBA finals. You know, I mean, that, that that's what's happened. But at the same time, you know, he has to figure out a way where let management do their job, let coaches do their job. Um, and, and you as a player, you have the ability to reach and extend the hand to, to get other free agents, per se, to even want to come there and play with you. And as long as your management and, and coaching and all that agrees, if that's the best move for the team, you, you can definitely help recruit and all that. But it seems like he's really trying to do a lot of different things um, that is a little bit out of the realm of, of even your star elite player. But he's a franchise player, and that's not something every NBA, every NBA team has. All right, you're tuned to the baseline, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing – the hot button topics of the NBA, our segment of the breakdown. All right, so I'm going to read you this quote. Um, this is uh, from the Washington Post, a great article uh, that was written in um, in in after math. It's by uh, Nick Eilson. Uh, so if you have an opportunity, go ahead and check out the article. And uh, basically, there's obviously a lot of uh, you know a lot of thoughts that are coming out with reference to the firing of David Blatt and the situation now that has happened in Cleveland. And this was a quote from Dallas Mavericks coach Rick Carlisle. He says, it's a shocker. It's just a real shocker. He's done some phenomenal things, and he's talking about David Blatt adjusting to this league. I'm embarrassed for our league that something like this could happen. It's just bizarre. Now, is Tyrone Lue going to coach the All-Star game? It just leaves you with a bit of an empty feeling because Blatt's a great guy, and he did a great job there. Let me ask you this question, Shaw. What does this impact mean to the coaching community, and what does this impact mean when we are talking about the ideology, ideology in the importance of a head coach as it pertains to the players and winning a championship? I, I don't know if it teaches us anything we didn't already know. I think Van Gundy, Stan, um, even texted some guys. He texted Spolstra. I think he texted Steve Clifford and said, listen, you look, if that can happen to Blatt, you know, that can happen to any, any, any one of us. I mean, they, coaches know that this is not – nothing is forever. Nothing is promised to them. Um, but again, the situation and the way it was in which it was handled is 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 suspect, and it does hurt, you know, for for coaches like that. I think Carlisle is head of, of of the coaches' association, if you will. So he's definitely got to speak up on quote unquote injustices, you know, in 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 the coaching ranks when something like that happens, and you have to stick up for your guys. Blatt is not a guy who's going to be out of a job long, you know. I think he's already been linked to potentially the Brooklyn Nets, potentially linked to the Golden State next year. If Lou Walton obviously is going to go move on and take a head coaching position, he was considered to be Kerr's top assistant before that whole situation played out, where he could get a head coaching job in Cleveland anyway. Um, but that's not the point here. I mean, the point is really that you know you're never safe, and especially when you have 
um, a, a, a player in, in the, of the elk of LeBron. And there's really only one, two or three of those guys out there. I can say maybe Durant and Curry, where it's like, okay, you're going to bend to whatever they ask you to do from the front office and management standpoint. Um, and that truly means your job is never safe. All right, Sean, but I, I, I get your answer and I agree with your answer to an extent, but I don't know if it's answered my question totally. What I'm asking is, what does this mean? What does this kind of look actually have the impact that this could mean in the NBA culture? Never mind in baseball. We've seen this kind of shadiness before with GMs do, pulling this kind of stunt. Everybody remember when Willie Randolph and how he got fired when he was the head coach for the New York Mets. Not everybody bought into Willie Randolph. Not everybody even believed that Willie Randolph was still going to be the manager for the, the New York Mets, um, I think some five, six years ago. But the way that he was being fired, to me, set a bad precedent in the way things are being handled. And then what I'm asking you is, is by how David Griffin, I understand the sense of urgency that he felt that this needed to happen, but how this happened on the precipice of what has happened in my mind and in your mind, do you believe that how this, will this leave a bad stain on the way things are being handled from a management perspective, all the way trickling down to how head coaches are now being, how they're being respected to the, even their own players? No, I mean, honestly, no. I think it's, I, I don't want to say isolated incident, but it's an incident specific to the Cleveland Cavaliers and, and, and their situation. Um, because I think even part of Van Gundy's text to those guys, he was just saying, well, you know, our management is a little bit more stable. You have, you know, Dan Gilbert, who is, you know, for, ball, ball, for all intents and purposes, he, he's a maniac. You know what I mean? He's very passionate about his team. And, you know, there's a lot of intense pressure right now. And remember, LeBron is holding them hostage each single year. He's going to be opting out each year. It's like, oh, if you don't do it right, well, I still, you know, I can still, you know, opt out next year. And that's part so he can always continue to get the max amount of money from, from the salary cap that, 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 that will yield. But he's still holding them over, over, you know, bending them over, if you will, and holding them hostage. Cleveland is a very, very specific situation when it came down to this. And Say what you want about David Griffin and whether he's right or wrong, because he even said this might be the wrong decision. Only time will, will, will tell. But I don't know that this is something that you'll see, you know, happening, you know, next year. Like, OK, next year, the Golden State Warriors are, are 31 and 10 at the All-Star break and they're looking to fire Steve Kerr. Like, I, I can't imagine that this is a situation that's going to continue to play itself out on other teams. All right. Well, it to me, it's it. I feel it to be very tenable at best. We've already seen what's happened with the Brooklyn Nets firing. Uh, Lionel Hollins. And, and what I'm saying is, is that it's the uniqueness of the situations that is bringing about more attention to this than necessarily what the wins losses, because you can tell when players are playing for their coaches. OK, we just saw a few weeks ago or maybe close to a month ago, Markeith Morris throwing a towel in the face of Jeff Hornacek. Now, whether or not we believe that Markeith Morris and Jeff Hornacek love each other, really hate each other, or good friends or buddies, it just sets a bad tone, a level of disrespect, have you, when a guy's throwing a towel at the head coach. And if you're management, you should be doing something about that, in which they did. They suspended Markeith Morris, and to the and really to the um to the credit of Jeff Hornacek, he could easily put his better player, Markeith Morris, because Eric Bledsoe is down with an injury. Now Brandon Knight's down with the injury. And we don't know what to make of this Phoenix Suns team. He could by default just say, just so that I can win basketball games, I'm going to put Markeith Morris out there on the basketball court. But he has younger players who need to understand the game, who need to understand the culture, who need to understand it. No matter how much money you're getting paid, it, you, you cannot win this game by yourself. And so he's basically relegated Markeith Morris to the bench. He's basically got that guy just sitting next to the, the water boy and, and just throwing towels and haymaker high fives for the rest of the players that are out there doing what he should be doing on the basketball court. And I guess my point that I'm making with regards to David Blatt, Tyrone Liu, is that when a GM out of nowhere comes down and says, we're relieving you of your duties, you're the next man up, how much assurance and how much credibility are you actually giving that next guy standing in for the guy that you just got rid of when there's really not much that you've done to solidify the idea that you truly back that head coach, which, by the way, is the person that you hired to begin with? No, yeah, I mean, and I agree. I mean, I think that's why Lou said exactly what he said. He was like, it could be me, you know, at any point if I, if I don't produce. So there is a situation in place in Cleveland um, and then even around the NBA, when, when you have championship level expectations that you have to produce and you have to um, get your team in, in, in the right situation. And, and, and I guess for a Cleveland Cavaliers, the record did not necessarily indicate the true depiction of what was going on, on in their franchise and in their locker room.
Yeah, man, it's going to be a really interesting scenario now moving forward. We've just seen Tyro Lou's, uh head coaching debut really uh, not go off so well as the Chicago Bulls rudely welcomed the Cavaliers on their own home court, by the way, that uh, they still are going to be a force to be reckoned with moving forward, not just in the division, but, uh, but also within the Eastern Conference. Uh, but again, it, it's just a, it's a unquestionable to me, it's just crazy the precedent that's being set now with how head coaches are getting quote unquote offed in the NBA. You know what, Shaw? I kind of feel like we, we need to we need to do a little go on get type thing, but it would just be it would just be disrespectful. I don't want to disrespect David Black like that, but it just has a real go on get kind of feel to it, man. I'm gonna leave that one all the way alone because <laughs> he, he definitely had to get from Cleveland. But like I said earlier, he's he's gonna be sought after. Um, and you know, if he, he might have to humble himself a little bit, but I think he's going to find a job very, very soon. I would not be surprised if, uh, maybe out in Brooklyn, maybe, um, Prokhorov might be, you know, thinking about it. If, if he doesn't figure out a way to get Tibbs, you know, maybe yeah. he should go after it. Maybe he should go after a David Blatt. I, I know a few international players that would love to, 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 to run that kind of offense that David Blatt's been wanting to run. And he may have the actual pieces to be able to do it. Doesn't mean that they'll be successful. But it will bring in an exciting brand of basketball that I think the Brooklyn fans are will definitely love to enjoy. You're tuned to the baseline, Cal Lee Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the breakdown. Drop, 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 drop. Time now for the drop, Cal Lee Warren Shaw of the NBA Baseline Podcast. You can catch us on Rabble TV at Rabble TV is the Twitter handle. So Shaw, this is that time of the year where we must bow down to guys who've been putting in that work so far at the midway point of the season. Time for us to do NBA midseason awards. And so the first award that I think we should kind of weigh in on is who do we think is deserving of Coach of the Year honors at the midway point? Shaw, I'm going to let you start it off. I mean, this is really should be and would be not necessarily an open and shut case, but it would really be come down to Golden State and San Antonio. The situation in Golden State is a little awkward um, because of Luke Walton, Steve Kerr, and, you know, who can actually get, you know, the award per se. Luke Walton can win Coach of the Month awards, but he can't win Coach of the Year award. I think that's what the NBA had ruled. So, but he could win Coach of the Midseason award. So I think that's where it would potentially go. Um, but my actual pick on, for this award would be, and you know, somebody and listen to our show. I've been just a fan of what they've been able to do, and it would be Coach Carlisle from the from the Dallas Mavericks. Um, I just don't feel like this is a team and roster that should be nearly as competitive as they are. Um, and I really respect what he's been able to do from a coaching standpoint. I think obviously Golden State and San Antonio doing an amazing job, um, but I think they have the talent on their teams to kind of do what they've been doing, although they are setting historic pace. Not taking anything away from them. But if I had a vote, I'd, I'd, I'd sneakily give it to Coach Carlisle. Yeah, I, listen, I, it's tough, man. It's really tough. Um, you can make an argument for Luke Walton to maintaining some of these guys, um, you know, the Warriors, to, to, to be on the kind of pace that they're on, I mean, better than where they were a year ago. Um, you could make the argument for Greg Popovich as far as having the best defensive team and, it's, and a team that's literally on pace to maybe have one of the best defensive seasons in NBA history. Um, it, it's just, it's unprecedented. The guys, I'm with you with regards to Rick Carlisle, but I'll also throw out there as an honorable mention is uh, Coach Scott Skiles. I think maybe if if the Orlando Magic had five or six more wins uh, more so far this year, he should really have, really be in this consideration and be in this conversation because I look at what this Orlando Magic team has been doing from the beginning of the season and up to this point, and they have been competitive for, I, I can't even imagine, like really almost every single game, they virtually are in it. And very very seldomly do I see any teams completely overmatch them or overpower them. There are probably some wins that are left out on the table that down the road, I'm sure Scott Skiles is going to get get the best out of his guys to go out and finish and execute. Uh, but I think an argument could be made as well, too, from a midseason standpoint and the expectations that were made. Rick Carlisle, no question, number one. I probably say Greg Popovich, number two, but a serious honorable mention, in my opinion, to Coach Scott Skiles for what this Orlando Magic team has been doing thus far this year. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. You know, like you said, if they, they've hit a rough patch lately, so they've been really bad in the month of January. Um, but other than that, he said they, they were, again, that's what we had 
um, you know, John Denton on our show featuring and talking about Orlando Magic and how well they were playing at that time. They've hit a little rough patch, but again, yeah, otherwise than that, I think they have done a great job and Skiles should definitely get some heavy consideration. All right, let's go ahead and, and focus our attention now to most improved player of the year, Shaw. Who do you have on your docket? This is a really, really interesting, you know, race for me. Um, I think there's a lot of guys and a lot of different ways you can go. I mean, I've seen Steph Curry being mentioned in this. I've seen um, uh, Draymond Green being mentioned in this. And I think those are, are viable candidates to me. But um, I would probably give the edge to C.J. McCollum in this award over Will Barton from the Denver Nuggets. Um, Will Barton is somebody I'd consider, obviously, for another award, potentially. But McCollum, uh, it's it's a little bit a little bit cheating on my part because I think we all knew, given the opportunity, he could be this good. So I don't know if he really is that much improved as opposed to his opportunity has improved. Um, but I will still give him the award you know, because he has lived up to it and it's been very, very consistent. But Will Barton would be a close second for me. Oh, man. I, there's a few people I could throw out there. Um, you, C.J. McCollum, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily – buy into Will Barton as much. Um, you're right. I, I have Will Barton probably more so for another award, which we'll probably get into next. But to me, there's two people I think that really stand out that I don't think a lot of people are going to be talking about. Um, Andre Drummond has just been phenomenal this year. I, I mean, he looked good last year, but to be doing what he's doing right now, averaging 13 and 13, um, some nights, uh, I'm sorry, he's actually averaging 17 and 15. But on some nights, I mean, it's just completely ridiculous, the, the, the point rebound totals. He still had some stats and some steals, some blocks. And I really think that the Detroit Pistons would not be where they are um, if not been for the elevated play of Andre Drummond. Keep in mind, Brandon Jennings was gone for most of this half of the season, and I'm sure we would have been saying a lot of this, this team being successful is predicated on whether or not Brandon Jennings was going to come back and be able to contribute and be chemistry uh, you know, be a chemistry kind of guy and, and be a part of the team. It doesn't matter what the hell Brandon Jennings is doing because it's all about what Andre Drummond, Marcus Morris, and Reggie Jackson is going to do for this basketball team moving forward. And, and also Contavious Caldwell Pope. In my opinion, though, everything moves where Andre Drummond goes. If this, if he is out there and being active, this team is active. If he's defending and blocking shots, this team is a defensively better team. And this is the guy that Stan Van Gundy is like his his his, his little project, you know, that he's working on. And if he gets him to this point, man, I I can't imagine where else he, you know, where how high he, you know, he can climb up with his potential. The other person is Kent Bazemore for the Atlanta Hawks. I mean, who knew that this guy would arguably be the second best offensive player for the Atlanta Hawks. I mean, we were talking about it's supposed to be Jeff Teague. Jeff, P Jeff Teague has been MIA for most of this season. Um, Paul Millsap has been consistent, but he's had his up and down. Al Hawford, he is Al Hawford. Kent Bazemore has really been a godsend for, uh, for Coach Budenholzen and for why this Atlanta Hawks team is still a successful basketball team despite a lot of the, 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 uh, the mindset that this team was going to take a complete step back this year. Yeah, Bazemore was a great pick, especially since Corver has struggled and, you know, Bazemore's really stepped into that role, stepped in when, when Corver was injured. But even now that he's back, you know, Bays is still out there doing his thing. So I, I think that's a great pick. And I think Drummond, too, um, you know, it, it, it's also a viable thing, a viable player for this award. So that's what makes the most improved just so, you know, juicy to me because there's a lot of different ways you can look at it and a lot of ways you can analyze it. But I don't think any any pick could, would actually be wrong in this situation, especially when you get down to the end of the year. Definitely. You're tuned to the baseline. Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA, our midseason picks. Shaw and I breaking down the guys who we think are deserving at the midway point of uh, being awarded uh, this prestigious time of the year. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about sixth man of the year, Shaw. Um, I think we alluded to it. You were mentioning it. Will Barton is definitely one of the guys that should be up there. Is there anyone else that comes to mind other than Big Will? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, if, if Barton d wouldn't win it at this point, it's only because he has been a little bit inconsistent at times. And I think the other guy... For me, it's it's kind of hands down. It would be Ryan Anderson from the New Orleans Pelicans, and not because you know, the Pelicans are good or anything, but Anderson has just been very, very consistent. Uh, you know, for the for the entire season, really has those those off games that you see Barton have. Sometimes Barton will go off for thirty two, and then might have seven. You know, the very next night, Anderson has been pretty consistent. You know, he's he's a more of a veteran presence in the league. He's averaging sixteen a game, shooting over forty percent from the three point line, and is also helping the New Orleans Pelicans right their ship a little bit here towards the towards we, as we get to mid season. So for me, I. Give Anderson that the, the slight edge over Barton, not to not to shot Barton, not a little bit, but I can't see how Barton doesn't get consideration for this award. Yeah, man, I, I 
agree with you. I think Will Barton will probably be the the overall favor to be sixth man of the year, the midway the midway point. Another name I want to throw out there that might seem a little non prototypical, and Ryan Anderson too. I, I definitely give you on that one. How about Victor Oladipo? I mean, Victor Oladipo essentially has taken you know an embrace coming off of the bench because of Scott Skiles and the way that he wants to run the offense. And while his numbers as a person that comes off the bench isn't quite the same as what he was doing when he was starting, the impact that he's had for this Orlando Magic team has been pretty tremendous. I mean, the guy not only scores, he gets rebounds, he gives you some assists, he blocks shots, he gives you steals. I think his productivity has increased more, and the drive for him to be such a good basketball player is so much now up there. I think over the last month, his numbers have actually been pretty ridiculous in the scoring category and also in the steals and blocks category has helped the Magic win some key victories down the stretch over the last couple of weeks. And really, to me, by qualification standpoint, I mean, he would be in this conversation about being, being a sixth man of the year. So in my opinion, I, I mean, I think Will Barton definitely a number one, but I think a close second and maybe an even even to Ryan Anderson, Victor Oladipo gets my nod. Yeah, it's 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 a tough call for me and only people because I just don't see him as as a bench guy. I know he's I think he started 18 of the 38 games he's played. So I mean it's kind of about halfway now. He's back in the starting lineup now. You know, Scott just made another lineup change, so Peyton and Oladipo are back now. Fournier is coming off the bench. So I mean I I, I think it, it's it's a viable you know from a statistical standpoint, but I just don't feel like he's a true. Uh, six man at this point of his career and I don't think he's going to finish the season that way off otherwise I mean because other you know really this would have been Isaiah Thomas's award if Boston didn't have the injuries that they had in the backcourt he was running away with it you know in the first 15 or so games of the season and then all those things changed so now he's a starter and he can't even be get, get consideration for it ah but that's the reason why it's called mid-season my friend mid-season no. yeah, yeah I mean I, we don't know what they're going to be doing after we have this podcast bro I'm just worried about what they've been doing <laughs> so Ah, ah, that's the caveat, my friend. That's the caveat. But I agree with you. I definitely agree with you. It really would have been between Will Barton and Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas, just like his little small self, would have been running away with that award, most definitely. All right, y'all. Let's go ahead and uh, let's talk D Y uh, D. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry D P O Y, Defensive Player of the Year. I, listen, I already know who's in my mind, and if anything, since we've known each other for a long time, I know who's probably in your mind, but I'll let you go ahead and spit it out because it should be on everyone else's tongue as well. Who should be the defensive player of the year midseason? Well, well, I mean, we haven't had this discussion off air, so this is, you know, is the big reveal, and if it's not Kawhi Leonard for anybody, I don't know what's going on in the NBA. If you look I, at everything. I would go from Kawhi <laughs> to Kawhi. <laughs> like, that's, that would be my mindset if they tell me anybody else right now. Yeah, yeah sure. at this at this point, it doesn't make any sense. All, all the statistics and everything that you can choose from the eye test show that Kawhi Leonard is, is the best defensive player right now. I think a 92 defensive rating, which is top in the league. I think he has the highest amount of win shares and, and all that. And again, he's just locking down and taking on some of the best players in the NBA every single night while still doing it on the offensive side of the basketball. Kawhi Leonard, hands down. Yeah, no question. And there's nothing more for me to say. You said it best, my friend. Kawhi Leonard is by far, like, you know, the just hands running away with it already at the midway point uh, to be the best. And listen, Anybody who was telling me that him being defensive player of the year last year was a fluke, we gave you our reasons when we did our show a year ago um, saying this is why we think he's deserving. Now, maybe someone else was deserving of it at that time, but we just felt like we wanted to be ahead of schedule in giving that award. So we're doing it again. That Kawhi Leonard, we told you, you knew it, just accept it, learn to love it, and move on with it. <laughs> All right, y'all, let's go ahead and, and, and move on to Rookie of the Year. And this is a really interesting one because I, I know where probably most people's eyes are fixated on, but there's a person that I've been talking about from the very, very beginning. And, uh, and I know a lot of New Yorkers, they, they don't want to admit it because they were too busy trying to make this boy to look out like, like Sean Bradley. But I'm going to let you go ahead and give me your pick on who you think is deserving Rookie of the Year right now. Yeah, this is a push for me. I wasn't able to ch wasn't able to choose. You know, this goes back to the year. I think we had the one tie in the rookie of the year race. And for me, I think it would have to be a tie at this point. I can't say Carl Anthony Towns or Chris Porzingis is any better than the other. The reason I give Por Towns has slightly better statistics. You know, from a, from a points and rebounding standpoint. Um, 
Porzingis has them in the blocks and the three-point shooting, but and also Porzingis has his team competing at a higher level than, than Towns does right now. Um, and Porzingis might even be a little bit more of a focal point offensively, I think, on the Knicks than, than Towns is. But both those guys are, are doing amazing things um, for, for, for their respective franchises, and I would have to give it um, a tie. I have to split my vote. Yeah. My vote. Oh, that's okay. I mean, that's all right, man. I know you don't want to fall off the ledge. I'm going to take a nosedive off the ledge. I'm going to tell you this right now. I think Chris Stapps Porzingis – right now is the favorite now maybe to nba statisticians and the favorability because carl anthony towns is a number one pick i get that i'm okay with that that's fine but i'm looking at it exactly for what i see it Kristaps Porzingis is a difference maker right now. And he is playing next to Carmelo Anthony, which you would think that Carmelo Anthony should be the one who supersedes and overshadows this basketball team. No, Kristaps Porzingis is is basically become the more popular athlete in New York City right now for basketball than Carmelo Anthony. And because of what Kristaps is bringing to the basketball court, uh, facilitating and helping Carmelo Anthony to be a better player, a more well-rounded player, the New York Knicks are winning basketball games. And at the end of the day, I get it. Rookie of the year does not equate to, you know, wins and losses because usually rookies of the year that are in that kind of elk are your franchise players. But who's to say that Kristaps Porzingis is not a franchise player, even though they still have Carmelo Anthony? When it's all said and done, Carmelo Anthony may or may not still be a New York Knick, but Kristaps Porzingis, for him not to be a New York Knick, to not to be the foundation for this team and to do what he's done in his rookie year with the amount of points, rebounds, blocks, threes that he's taking at 7-3 to do what he's doing right now is truly phenomenal. And that in itself to me, just by the eye test alone, and I take nothing away from Carl Anthony Towns because I think that he's an excellent talent. He's going to do damage in the NBA. And hopefully the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves will do right, not screw this up like they did with Kevin Love, and he will stay a Timberwolf. But right now, Chris Stapps Porzingis is KRS1 of the NBA as far as rookies go. Can't be mad at that. You know, you said, you know, one of the things that you said, too, about him acclimating to the New York culture and playing with Carmelo. I think he has probably had a harder adjustment than Towns has, um, obviously playing in the bigger market and, and, and playing with Carmelo and getting Carmelo to trust in him, which Melo now does. Um, you know, but again, fourth now in jersey sales in the NBA as a rookie, you know, passing guys, you know, like that you would never expect him to see ahead, including Carmelo um, in his rookie year. Um, shout out to Chris Stapps and what he's been able to do. And I, like I said, you can't go wrong with that pick at all. Most, most definitely. Chris Stapps, Porzingis. I, I, they have like 50 million names. I'm sticking with KRS-One. That's just me. I love doing my thing. Finally, Shaw, you know, we had to save the best for last. And um, it's well-deserved, um, even though I think it's a pretty one-sided affair when you look at it for what it is. We're talking about MVP, midseason. Some can make the argument that why even bother worrying about giving the, waiting to do a midseason MVP? Just give the MVP to Steph Curry right now. But maybe, I, I don't know, I was holding out for the hope maybe, Shaw, that you might have had somebody else that might be able to run with Steph Curry and what he's done this year. Or maybe, uh, maybe that's just wishful thinking. Yeah, that's wishful thinking. I, there's At this point of the season, I can't give it to anybody else other than, than, than him. Yes, he slowed down a little bit by what his standards would be and how he started off the season. Um, but you know every every metric, every single thing out there points to him winning this MB, winning and MB, sorry being the back to back MVP champion this this season. There's some guys coming on at a little bit of a late. You know you can say Durant, Westbrook are you know, but they're always going to split their vote if you will. Um, you know you can think of you know really really long shot to Marcus Cousins in Sacramento what he's been able to do and has a king kind of on the right track and a host of other guys that 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 could be listed. But it, it's Steph Curry hands down and and there's really I mean again we can even say Kawhi Leonard potentially too. But um, I think it's Steph Curry without without a doubt. Yeah, there's no question. Even when Steph Curry slows down some. It, it's still to a level that I think most of the rest of the top players in the NBA are really playing at this moment in time. It, it's not even just how Steph Curry is doing it. It's it's where, where and when Steph Curry is doing it. It seems that every critical junction, every critical play that has to be made, you know who's going to do it, and yet you still can't stop the guy. You know, we can't necessarily say that for guys like Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant because I think at times, sometimes they stop themselves. There's Listen, Steph Curry is the first person who's willing to take that shot, and he's going to be the first person who's willing to take that L. You know, so I can't, I cannot necessarily say I, I see that right now for anyone else that's doing that in the league. While Kawhi Leonard is about as close as you could possibly get to it, remember this is all predicated on the master, the mastery of Greg Popovich and how Greg Popovich has basically 
systematically placed Kawhi Leonard in that position to be this kind of guy. I, I think there's going to come a point where when we start talking about the greatness of Kawhi Leonard and the things that he does on the bigger stages is when we can start mentioning that in the same elk of Steph Curry. But the fact that we do this with Steph Curry and Steph Curry continually does this on primetime TV, on the biggest of stages, I mean, he basically orchestrated a 43-point blowout against the team that everyone said should have won the NBA Finals championship last year. He orchestrated that. Nobody else on that Warriors team and nobody else that I can even recall in the NBA could orchestrate what Steph Curry orchestrated and him doing that when it mattered the most, when a statement. I mean, people can make the argument, and I'm just saying, conspiracy theory here. Everyone can say that Steph Curry is responsible for David Black getting fired, right? I mean, hmm. that's how crazy this thing may sound, but that's the effect of Steph Curry and what he's been doing so far this year. So no question, he is the midseason MVP, and I'll be very surprised if the way that the Warriors continue to play at this kind of level, that he does not wind up being the MVP of the NBA. You're tuned to the baseline, Cal Lee Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA, our segment of the drop. Finally, Shaw, before we segment out of the drop, everybody has seen who's been named as the official starters for the Eastern and the Western Conference All Stars. We're all good with that, but there's still one group left to go. And that's who we think the reserves should be. Shaw, I'm going to let you go ahead and run off your picks of who you think is deserving to be the uh, reserves for the East and the West. And then, Shaw, from your perspective, who do you think ultimately is going to be the biggest snub? Wow. You know, here's here's where we're going to go, and I'll try to go through this quickly. I think John Wall is a lock in the East. DeMar DeRozan, I think, is a lock in the East. Jimmy Butler, Andre Drummond, Paul Millsap. I think those uh, those five guys, they, they have to make it. The final two spots, I think, go somewhere between Chris Bosh, Pau Gasol, and Isaiah Thomas. Um, and, and I'm very, very torn on, on, on that. I think Gasol has to get the edge um, simply because the Bulls are a better team, um, and he has been doing it all season. And then it really becomes comes down between Bosh and Isaiah. I'd like to give it to Isaiah Thomas, especially since he would be he would have been a front runner for the six man award at this point. He just played great basketball, um, and and the Heat have been struggling. But Chris Bosh has been a, his guy who's been there time and time and time again, and I know how coaches vote. It's gonna end up being Chris Bosh over there. But if it was me, I'd give it to Thomas. Yeah, I listen. I agree with you. I feel like the politics are gonna sway for Chris Bosh getting in there just because the wins loss record still favors the Miami Heat, and then you look at the the you look at a, the the Boston Celtics who are so up and down over the last couple of weeks. It's hard to say whether or not that's going to be an indictment on Isaiah Thomas coming in as a reserve. I'd like to think that maybe coaches actually see the potential of what Isaiah Thomas can bring, and they want to see the excitement of him playing in this 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 atmosphere in this game. Um, because quite frankly, I'm not. I don't care for seeing Chris Bosh playing in the All Star game unless he's going to dunk or do something spectacular. I want to be entertained, and I think Isaiah Thomas is a far more entertaining basketball. Paul Gasol is a far more entertaining basketball player than Chris Bosh. No disrespect to Chris Bosh, but I think he likes doing his thing in Miami, you know, riding camels or buying camels for his wife for their birthday and stuff like that. Other than that, I don't have to see him um, in Toronto, but you're, you're right, Shaw. I think the nod may go to Gasol and Bosh, although I would love to see Gasol and Isaiah Thomas. Who you got for the West? On the West, I think it's DMC, without a doubt, Chris Paul. Uh, Draymond Green's going to get in there. Harden has to get in there. Um, and then I think Dirk has to get in there, too, because the Mavs have to have some representation. Where it gets a little bit murky, um, I think, is whether or not Clay, Anthony Davis, Blake Griffin, and Damian Lillard, um, you know, of, the, of those guys get in. Um, I feel like Clay's going to get in simply because, again, there's the Warriors. They have been so great. Um, and he's picked it up as of late. So I don't think if this was maybe a couple of weeks ago that it would have been a lock. But because he is who he is and the Warriors are who they are, Clay's going to end up getting in. And I think the, the snubs come down to Anthony Davis, Lillard, and, and Blake Griffin. I think Davis is probably going to get in um, when leaving Blake and Lillard on the outside. Yeah, I, I think that the, the hurt, the injury to Blake Griffin is probably going to hurt him the most. So he probably won't make the All Star, and that's okay. I think, it, yeah. you know, long term wise, this is about the Clippers finally quieting the critics and actually putting themselves in some kind of position to be conversely to be talked about seriously as being a contender in the West. But I think what this comes down to is no love for Jaja. Come now, uh -huh, this, is, this is this is <laughs> madness, man. This is complete madness. Listen, if I had to replace someone, no disrespect to Clay Thompson, but he's already dating a, a, a supermodel superstar. We need to start giving some love to Jaja, man. Jaja is should be out there as a reserve. But I think, albeit, I have no no arguments about who you think should be because you look at the the, the deck is completely stacked against him. 
Uh, Anthony Davis, despite his numbers dipping a little bit, um, you know, and he's had some of those back issues, he still had an all-star caliber year at the very least. Um, and, and I mean, it, there's really, you know, very little arguments there about, you know, where the where the where the, where the choices should sway. I think the one person probably Damian Lillard could, could clearly, you know, get a get a nod. It's just it's tough, man, because I really would love to see a couple of guys who I think, given what they've done this year up to this point, should be deserving and acknowledged as a person who should be making an appearance in the All Star. And I just think Zaja should be one of those guys. Um, and yeah, I would sacrifice Clay Thompson from doing that. I think Draymond Green is, should be a lock. And so you got already two Warriors in there. The Dallas, I, I don't know about Dirk. I, I feel like that's more of a respect call. Um, I, I think Zaza has been a much more valuable player for the for the for the for the Mavericks, even though Dirk has been clutch in certain situations. I just think the constant um, consistency of Zaza Pachulia has has credited, you know, for what most bigs are not able to do in the Western Conference at this particular time frame. So it'll be a tough sell, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you on your picks. I, I just feel like Zaza deserves a little bit more love. Oh, I, I and I have no problem with Zaza getting you know some consideration, but there's just no way with those t- t- those titan of names that are on the list that, that anyone's going to look at him again. The fact that he almost got booted in as a starter um, says a lot about what he's been able to do and how much the, the the Dallas community appreciates what he's been able to do for them. You know, filling in that 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 pseudo void, I guess that DeAndre Jordan was supposed to fill for them. So Zaza's had has has had an amazing season, and we probably overlooked him for you know potential most improved because he's so old. A lot of people don't consider a guy like that um, in, in, in the running for that, That's but he's I definitely mean, somebody. Shake things up, man. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Listen, yeah. and I had the perfect scenario for Jaja to get in in the reserves because you know it's going to be up to Toronto and Drizzy Drake going to do his thing and stuff, and they're going to have like that all you know uh, flashing lights, Kanye style kind of intro going on for all the players. And then you know when Jaja gets up there, you know bust out, bust the rhymes out there doing Jaja, Jaja, Jaja. You Good know what I'm saying? Just, I'm telling you, man. And we resurrect Buster Rhymes' career again. Jaja gets some love. The North gets crazy. And then, I mean, we, it, 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 we must see TV on TNT. That's all I got to say. Well, let's call NBA Entertainment. You know, go ahead and get you, you know, another hat to wear. Um, and get you a job to help program the NBA All-Star game. Especially as Zaza ends up getting in there. Brother. I'm telling you, man. This is like, I'm building up a resume as I speak, man. I could be all NBA and people don't even know. All NBA. <laughs> you tuned to the baseline. Kali Ward Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the drop. <laughs> Time now to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's rock. All right. My watch says noon o'clock. What is your say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Out it well, let me tell you something. I know what the time says out there in uh in, in, in Los Angeles. It's that time for Josh Smith to get on up and get on out of here. So another gonna get. I know I'm gonna get. And so what did he wind up doing? He go on get down to Houston. Because that's how I like to talk down there in Houston, right? Now Josh Smith gets traded to the Houston Rockets. I I mean, you talk about the unconventional path to come back to where you started, Shaw. I mean, what do we make of Josh Smith finding his home away from home back in Houston? Yeah, he was traded for basically a bag of chips, man. And, you know, they just wanted to get him out of there. Um, he seems to be playing well back in Houston. He understands his role there. They want him to do the things that he does in terms of shooting and, and passing and, um, you know, playing some some solid defense at time. He's, he's getting minutes already. So um, this is something that situation that, you know, even our man Ben Bolston said it didn't work out for them in the, in the LA Clippers. And they just needed to find a way to get him off the roster before it became a distraction in the locker room. So good job by them for, you know, not letting this drag out. And, you know, the Houston Rockets now getting another guy who can help them turn their season around. And let's give credit to Doc Rivers. He read the writing on the wall. He understood that this wasn't going to work. And from a financial standpoint, he's obviously doesn't care about how much he would have been paying Josh Smith. This is going to jeopardize his team's opportunity from a chemistry perspective to be together and all in to try to make this run. He knew that he had to get rid of him sooner than later. Out in New York, Shaw Carmelo Anthony passes Larry Bird on the all-time scoring list. I'm a little saddened by this, but we knew that this was coming with prolifically one of the best offensive players in the game of basketball. Yeah, and before we you know, even finish, you know, our, our script here you know he also passed I guess Gary Payton I didn't know Payton was ahead of Larry Bird shows you how much I know about the NBA scoring list but you know shout out to Carmelo what he's been able to do moving up the ranks I think it, it puts him shout 30th. out to Gary Payton for even having a goal to do it for, for real I think that puts Melo 30th all time um you know looking like he should eventually get into the Hall of Fame when all is said and done yeah all right and Listen, congratulations to Carmelo. And you know what, Shaw? Congratulations to Carmelo Anthony 
um, for the kind of season that he's having helping this New York Knicks team. I and mean, we, we, we scrutinized and we patronized him quite a bit. We've always thought of him being more of a selfish person. The organizations usually fall to be has to his uh, becking call, but he's been doing a fantabulous job uh, with the New York Knicks. He's bought into what Phil Jackson and, and Derek Fisher want and are expecting of him. And he's actually making his teammates that he's playing with better. Let's, I mean, we take, other than Chris Dapps Porzingis, he's, he's working with a mosh pit of, 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 of confusing talent right now that are still trying to find themselves, let alone trying to find their way to wins in the Eastern Conference. And I just commend Carmelo Anthony for the way that he's turned his, his game around and the way that he's helped turn that franchise around with his all-around play. Out in Golden State, and not a moment too soon, Steve Kerr finally returns to the sideline, not because we weren't impressed by what Luke Walton was helping the Golden State Warriors do, but just simply because we've been hearing about it, how he had the surgery, he had a setback from the surgery, and just to see him out on the basketball court, I think it's really good, and I know a lot of coaches that respect Steve Kerr are happy to see him back on the sidelines coaching his team. Yeah, it seemed pretty seamless when he came back, you know, Luke Walton goes back into to his role and, you know, kind of things get reset to how we would have thought the season would have started for the Golden State Warriors. But nonetheless, again, you know, getting Kerr back is not an indictment on anything that Luke Walton did. It's just, you know, it was just that time. Kerr, uh, Walton knew he was a placeholder, if you will. Um, it's great to have the guy back on the sidelines where he belongs. And, you know, this has given Walton the experience that he needs now to go and become a head coach elsewhere. All right. And then finally, Shaw, interesting Brandon Jennings, uh, of all people, is calling out the Detroit Pistons for not having a leader. Now, we heard the other night how Stan Van Gundy is 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 really the, the you know, he was emphatic in his means and says, I truly believe that our team goes out of its way to be mediocre. That that is that is we strive for mediocrity. So now you've got Brandon Jennings calling out the Detroit Pistons <laughs> for not having a leader. What do we make of all of all of this 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 crazy, uh, you know, say reverse psycho psychological uh, basketball babble? Well, we knew at some point that the wheels would potentially come off on this Brandon Jennings come off the bench thing, and I don't know if he's upset about not starting and not getting more minutes on a regular basis, but. Um, he is a guy, he's one of the more veteran guys on the team, actually, um, who can definitely start to try to step in and be a leader, even if he is coming off the bench and accepting his role. Um, I think this is just a sign of things to come for in Detroit, and I would not be surprised if Jennings moved by the All-Star play. Yeah, man. I it just it's, it, I, I just don't know why players tend to say the things that they say. If, if, if the idea is, is that you're trying to call attention to yourself, well, congratulations, you've done that. But when you basically say that the Pistons um, don't have a leader, Aren't you a part of that basketball team? I mean, aren't aren't you? Shouldn't you? Be, why don't you show them how it's done? Show them what a leader is supposed to be for that basketball team. And again, man, I, I you know I, I credit sometimes for players when they when they have a podium, a platform for them to step up and to say something that needs to be said. You know, like a Jimmy Butler. People question, you know, whether or not he should have said it, didn't say it. We know what kind of player Jimmy Butler is. I'm still trying to figure out what kind of player Brandon Jennings is. And for him to basically say that when this basketball team was winning when he wasn't on, you know, playing basketball for them, recovering from his injuries, kind of makes it hard pressed to show any kind of credibility in the things that you have to say. That's just me. But maybe I'm just crazy. Just call me crazy. Anyway, know. awesome show this week, Shaw. Um, great, great stuff all around, my man. And uh, hey, man, we're, we're getting right around that that point. But it wouldn't be without some exciting nonsense and craziness happening in the association. Absolutely. Again, it's just a great time as always. What a time to be alive. You know, I know that gets overused, but I'm loving the NBA right now and the drama that that's associated with it as always. And we're going to sneak up on us or we're going to sneak up on the trade deadline. A couple of things already moving and shaking already. Um, you know, we're going to be right here to cover it all as always. I didn't get to say in the, in the beginning, but salute, salute to all you fans, listeners. I'll say here in the outro, thank you for, for being a part of our show on a regular basis. Make sure you're tuned into us now. We're doing more more ways to get, get at you, especially with the rebel.tv. Um, and it's always, always, always a pleasure to be with you guys. Yeah, man. And we appreciate everyone continually following up. Uh, not just with ourselves, but also our colleagues that are out there putting together great podcasts, offering up great discussions. This is what continues the engine within the NBA is the conversations that we have. It's not just the controversy, but it's also the collaboration that means so much to why the game continues to grow the way that it grows. And so we'd like to thank you and yours. For the baseline, Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys. And we'll catch up with you next time.